All right, beautiful. There we go. We are live with Dr. Jesse Craig. I actually don't think I've ever, I've ever called you Doctor Doctor Jesse before. Yeah, you don't you don't need to call me Doctor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you gotta you gotta reward the work, the time, the effort that was put in to get those letters. Yeah. It was a. Uh, I get random emails and people call me Doctor, and it feels weird still. So. Mm -hmm. That's how you know whether or not they're within like the circle, the friend group of sending you emails when it leads with doctor. You're like, eh, hmm, red flag. <laughs> Sign it real hard, Jesse. What are you going to try to sell me? Yeah. I still get emails actually from people trying to sell lab equipment. Is it the Texas group? It's like a, it's a whole bunch of different people. I don't, I usually just delete them right away. They have been relegated to the spam folder now. Yeah. Not in the market. You never know if you want like a neck suction, neck pressure thing. True. I don't know why you'd want it, but. Or one of those lower body boxes that uh, Jeremy built. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice, man. Well, let's do this. So for everybody listening that doesn't know who you are, can we give them the elevator pitch on kind of your background, who you are, what you do? The goal of the conversation today is for us to have a very bird's eye view chat about this nearest technology that's becoming more and more popular and prevalent in this fitness strength and conditioning realm, just to kind of give people some context, what it is, what does it actually do? Like, how do you guys use it in research? And then importantly, what are some of the, the limitations of the technology that we just need to keep in mind when we're having these conversations, because no one likes to talk about limitations. Everyone just likes to talk about, Oh, look at this awesome stuff it gave me. And so just yeah. kind of like, give a framework to this up and coming, up and coming air quote technology, but I'll, I'll let you lead with just who you are, your background, et cetera. Okay. Uh, yeah. So as James mentioned, I'm Jesse Craig. Uh, I did earn a PhD in kinesiology from Kansas state university. Um, and now my research concentrates or then, and now my research concentrates on oxygen delivery and utilization. So how we get, oxygen down to the muscles and how the, uh, the muscles use that oxygen. And then we evaluate how that impacts exercise tolerance. You might call it performance, but it's really tolerance in health and in disease. And so if we can't match the O2 demand with O2 delivery, we can't keep up the exercise or the just even daily activity in some of these disease populations, right? So uh, most of my work is evaluating mechanistic determinants of how we match the O2 delivery to utilization, which is actually a really neat, that, that ties into the NEARS because the NEARS itself is providing a, a non-invasive indication of that O2 delivery to utilization matching at the muscle. Um, in my master's, I trained with Tom Barstow, Dr. Tom Barstow. Uh, he is actually one of the world leading experts in NEARS technology, at least as it, how it if, is used in human performance or human exercise research. Um, so I have a decent background in NEARS and continue to publish with it and use it pretty regularly in our research now. So, Yeah, I came from a, from the powerhouse Kansas State with Barstool, Pool, Mush, and then uh, Banky, Binky, Banky, Binky, Binky, yeah. Binky. Um, yeah, phenomenal oxygen, physiology, cardiovascular, muscle stuff that's been coming out of there for a long time. And then I'll give, yeah. I was just gonna say, I'll give the quick background of, you were the postdoc when I was in the lab, the Utah Vascular Research Lab. And so everything that I know about the NEARS comes from you and Ryan and Joel. Hmm. And the reason I wanted to have you on is because like you still, like my knowledge of the NEARS is significantly better than most strength coaches, but then your knowledge of the NEARS is still light years better than mine. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> <I hope so. laughs> but so with that kind of as the background and framework here, right? Like you, you have a lot of time and experience using NEARS in a lab clinical setting. And so let's start with what we started to go down this path, but let's start with what the NEARS is, right? Cause you began to mention that we are trying to investigate this O2 supply, O2 utilization at the muscle and trying to figure out, are those two things being matched appropriately or not? Yeah. Right. And so the NEARS is one way we can look at that and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. So the NEARS technology, as we know it, I think, so K-State's an ag school. So we had an interesting side introduction to this NEARS technology where I, I think it was developed for the people evaluating like the viability or the moisture content and seeds for agricultural purposes. And then one day someone found out, hey, if 
I stick this on humans, it gets a signal. And so there's this really neat property with the chromophores in our body. So hemoglobin in the blood and myoglobin in the muscle. And then cytochrome C oxidase also is in there a little bit, but we're not going to worry, really worry about that too much. But these, these chromophores, when they have oxygen, it changes their absorption properties to this light. And so this neat property of near infrared light, so it's, it's on that border of the spectrum where it's not visible to us, some of it, and some of it might be. Um, but this light can penetrate through human muscle and skin and even bone. And so where they first started using NIRS was on the cerebral evaluation to see how much, you know, the oxygen saturation in the brain. And so, as I said, whether or not oxygen is present on those chromophores changes the absorption. And so they, they evaluate how much of that light that was emitted comes back. And that gives an indication of the saturation of those chromophores in that tissue of interest. Um, there's a couple different technologies in ears. I don't know that we really need to get into the nitty gritty of that. Yeah. I do know that one of the more popular ones, particularly probably in the performance field, um, are the continuous wave because they don't need like a big box. They can, like they can do it wireless, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so there are some limitations that go with that continuous that we can get into now or later. But in essence, what it does is it shoots the light through the skin down into the muscle and it penetrates, you know, roughly half the distance between the emitter and the detector. And so if you're sufficiently thin, you're getting primarily muscle signal and what it's picking out the the main signal from those is that saturation so it's just looking at it's it's using algorithms to calculate how much of that light got through and then based on that it's saying you're 75 percent saturation in this tissue mm -hmm. yeah so it's really just trying to give us an idea of the balance between how much of our chromophores hemoglobin myoglobin etc are loaded with oxygen and how many of them have been unloaded with oxygen yeah right because if you think i think like the thick equation is the easiest way to like, think about this balance potentially where like we're trying to figure out the vo2 at the muscle how much oxygen is being consumed potentially which is a balance between the utilization and the supply and so you have blood flow showing up and then i have this AVO2 difference component. Yeah, so the, the AVO2 is the extraction of that delivered oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And so then because of the physics, the conservation of mass, anything that's delivered and doesn't come back out was then taken up by the muscle and that's our oxygen consumption. And so um, I was gonna say in, in the lab, what would be the gold standard then for like, if you could do it exactly how you want, we're not worried about being invasive or not. The gold standard for investigating this balance of supply and utilization, what would the gold standard be? Yeah, so we can do a direct fit and we do it quite frequently here. And in essence, you introduce the, the catheter, so the small plastic tubes into the, so say we, we do a lot of knee extension exercise here. So you'll put a catheter in the femoral artery and the catheter in the femoral vein and then you'll measure blood flow upstream of that. And so now you have an idea of how much blood flow is being given to that leg. And with blood gas sampling from the arterial and venous side, we can see the O2 content, the pH, lots of different fun things in there. But in essence, what we get is, if you multiply the O2 content in the artery times the blood flow, we know delivery. And then we can do the same thing and get the oxygen extraction by doing the AVO2 difference across those two catheters. Mm -hmm. and, then, and so that, that is sorry, the, 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 no, that's the gold standard, as you said. So we know that everything going into that leg went through that vessel that we cathetered on the arterial side and everything draining that leg came through the venous catheter. And so there's, we do get some mixture from like, you know, the calf and the foot, but those aren't really active during the knee extension. So we can say pretty confidently that, you know, most of that, measurement that we're making is coming from the active muscle especially when it's active yeah exactly and then bringing the nears on board for that is usually going to be because not everybody really has access to the capacity to get anesthesiologists to place lines and to do all this far more invasive research um similar to the study 
that we were running together when I was in the lab, we used NEARS for my study because we didn't want to have to worry about the catheters and all of that fun jazz. So what role then is the NEARS playing? If we think same setup, I got a Doppler ultrasound on the femoral artery so I can get blood flow and then I'm putting a NEARS on. So what is the NEARS actually then doing for us if we think back to this, this FIC equation concept? Yeah, so the, the NEARS device we used, it all of the NEARS devices give that saturation, but they calculate that saturation based on two actual measurements. So they, they measure the oxygenated chromophores and the deoxygenated chromophores. And again, that has to do with the absorption. And so then based on the proportion of oxygenated to the total oxygenated and deoxygenated, it gives you a saturation. Uh, with our device, we can get pretty accurate absolute values for all of those. Um, and so, you know, depending on the experimental setup, the or what we what we cared to look at, that that deoxy signal is a pretty good approximation to that AVO2 difference. It's reflecting that kind of extraction. So at rest, your deoxy hemoglobin will be at a certain level, and then as you increase your exercise intensity, you'll see deoxy go up because you are extracting more out mm -hmm. of the blood as it goes through. Um, and so. With your study, we, we, we were on the, the cutting edge of NEARS use, and we can get into that if you want. I don't know how much you wanted to get directly to that. We do have a little more data with it, um, but it, it does seem based on what we did back at Kansas State with Barstow and Ryan Brockstrom that you mentioned, with, with a sufficiently advanced NEARS device, you can do a rough approximation of the FIC. Uh, calculation and it seems to be working especially in young people right now mm -hmm. but again that that requires you to have a doppler machine to measure blood flow and one of the more fancy nears but uh typically you know people in exercise testing they they use this nears just to evaluate either the an intervention so whether it's they pre-post training they want to see how the the extraction or the saturation is how the body performs at a given intensity of exercise pre and post intervention, whether that's training or detraining or some sort of drug intervention or mm -hmm. a beetroot supplement, which has been real popular in exercise physiology recently. Yep. So what, cause in my study, we use primarily that, that deoxy signal to help yep. tell us what's going on with extraction. Yep. So let's zoom back out a little bit because a lot of like the athletes that listen to this or the coaches are not going to have access to a Doppler and all these other things that we were fortunate enough to have. And yep. so the conversation in our realm, what people usually talk about is they just talk about SAT, which is this combination of the oxygenated chromophores, hemoglobin and myoglobin. That's a really important point because it's not just hemoglobin. And then yep. the total, which is oxygenated and deoxygenated together. And I'm looking at that ratio. So I think this could probably be a good place to dive in and talk about what are some of the potential limitations, things that we need to keep in mind with this technology because it is it's exciting because it does give you data but what's hard is i think always keeping in mind that we need to separate signal from noise in this and i think that can get really difficult with this technology when you consider the different confounding variables right like myoglobin is contributing potentially 60 to 90 percent of the signal um yeah. you're picking up fat tissue um i know that you can totally change the sat mark just by increasing temperature and getting more blood flow through the skin so you yeah. have all these different considerations and so i'd love to hear you kind of talk about like what are some of the limitations when we start talking about just looking at sat as our measure yeah so the looking at sat by itself is actually one of the safer approaches you can do with mm -hmm. the spectrum of nears technology so as i mentioned the continuous wave ones that they don't adjust for scattering and so just quickly scattering as as those photons go through the tissue, they hit things and bounce. And so you lose some of them that weren't absorbed. They just bounced and never made it back to the detector. Um, but a majority of them will get there eventually. And so it kind of delays them sometimes. Uh, the, the continuous wave doesn't adjust for that, but the saturation that it gets is still pretty accurate, all things considered. When you get down into the specific, like the deoxygenated or the oxygenated or the total of the two, um, it's not necessarily super accurate with those pieces of equipment, mm -hmm. but the changes during exercise in that sat seem to be pretty, pretty consistent with the equipment. Um, but like you mentioned, there, there are several confounding factors. So heat 
which would increase the skin blood flow. You can kind of dilute your saturation signal at that point. So the skin's not really metabolically active. It's primarily there just to cool us, right? And so you can artificially increase your saturation by getting a greater skin perfusion. Um, ideally, if you're using the sneers to evaluate either your training effect or your performance, you would try to keep like your conditions as similar as you could across. So in the lab, we can control all that really, really well, which isn't ne necessarily ecologically valid. So if we go out and do a field test, we're not going to be able to say, hey, it's exactly 72 degrees in there. Um, I think, though, that if, for people wanting to use NEARS to evaluate certain things, they should try to like keep consistency across their evaluation days, at least. Mm -hmm. um, but changes in saturation, yeah, I, I think I think you're safe with that with most of the technology that people can have easy access to. I would just, like you mentioned, if we don't know necessarily though, what's driving that saturation signal. So if they have a greater blood flow, saturation would be higher. If they had a lower metabolic demand, saturation could be higher. And so you don't know what's driving that difference day to day necessarily. That was gonna be an important one I wanted to bring up because yeah, like the, the change in SAT does seem to be accurate enough for us to use, but yeah. then being able to parse that a, apart, parse that apart, I don't really like that, but we'll go with it. In order to, to parse that, to figure out, okay, why is it changing? Is yeah. it a supply-based thing or is it a utilization-based thing? Which of these two components is really driving the delta? And I think yeah. the issue is, with just SAT, we can say it's definitely changing, but we can't go to the next level then and say it's this variable or this variable that's the primary driver of the change, correct? Yeah, yeah I mean, you could you could use some inference. Like, we wouldn't expect dramatic changes in O2 uptake mm -hmm. at, like, a given workload unless you went from being, like, really untrained to, to really trained. Um, but again, like there are lots of things that can impact that to delivery. Whether you know, you're, if you are at a different altitude that day, you can interfere with it a little bit. Or if you are, you know, maybe you haven't drank enough water in the day before, and so you're a little bit de you're dehydrated, you'd say, you know, and so that can interfere with O2 delivery a little bit, and also your hematocrit, your your heme concentration in the blood itself. So. Uh, yeah, I think as long as people try to be really consistent with how they're using it and the day and the test that they're doing, hopefully it's consistent across those. But there are lots of little tidbits in there that get in the way. For sure. I think so. Another important thing to bring up here is when we put the NEARS on. So, like, let's say you put it on a Rec Fem, for example. Yep. In our world, like I haven't finished reading that Nike paper you sent me yet. I'm just how like, part way into the methods right now, right? But they put it's it on dense. a quad. It's dense. They put it on a quad and had them go run on a like a uh, not a it's a self powered treadmill, right? One of those curved treadmills. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, what's interesting here is like if if we're putting this on and this more fitness strength conditioning realm, you're putting it on to probably want to make some more globalish type claims. Um, but with the technology that can actually get really difficult because we know the signal is not homogenous. It's a heterogeneous signal. So just because I'm seeing sat do one thing directly underneath this probe on the middle of my rec fem doesn't mean that I could come to a totally different conclusion if it was on a different part of my rec fem, if it was on a different muscle entirely. Yep. And so I would love to hear you unpack that a little bit, because that's, for me, one of the hardest things to figure out with this technology is I can only make claims about what's going on directly underneath this, like, several-inch long probe. Yeah, and so, yeah, like, the typical probe distance, I think people are probably getting, like, an inch deep into whatever they're measuring. So, like you mentioned before, if you do have a little bit of fat on your quad, uh any of that fat's going to reduce how deep it's penetrating into the muscle, but we'll say it's an inch on most people. Um, there's been some really neat work out of Japan in Kobe, Japan with Shinsaku Koga, who 
collaborated a bunch with my mentors as I was going through grad school and even now in my postdoc stuff. Uh, he has a really powerful NIRS device that they got approved over in Japan. And so they can do, they can do an extra deep kind of penetration and they've shown really, really interesting stuff that you mentioned. So all like the vastus lateralis, the rectus femoris, the vastus medialis, they all have separate kind of oxygenation characteristics during activity. But then if you go down the leg, so you go distal on that muscle versus proximal up near your hip, you can change how it behaves. And then the, the deep versus shallow, there's also quite a, a heterogeneity, as you said, of how that O2 delivery and demand is being matched just due to different properties of the muscle fibers themselves and how they're integrated with the blood vessels and the capillaries. And, you know, maybe that relates to the function of those particular muscles. Uh, again, they're, they're not all activated equally when we're doing an activity like running or when we're doing something biking or even a squat, you know, so there it's, that is an important consideration where one muscle may tell you something completely different from the other. That's the hardest one for me to try to wrap my head around when, cause I have one of those moxie monitors that the, yeah. the Nike paper used. Yeah. Um, I've played with it from time to time. I need to charge it and break it out and start playing with it again. Actually, that's been the hardest one for me to try to rationalize my way through is like, I'm looking at it and I'm trying to draw some conclusions, but like the minute that you know that something's heterogeneous, it gets really hard to, to like yeah. be able to make any type of large enough claim about what's going on, like whole body per se. Right. Yeah. And the point about the depth is really important also because like the Moxie monitor, for example, which will be the one that most people in, in our industry are using, like the depth you're going to get is not going to be anything substantial. Right. Yeah. And the rough estimate with the, I think the beer Lambert law that they base all this on is it's half the distance between your emitter and detector is mm -hmm. how deep you'll penetrate. And so I don't, I don't know that equipment specifically. But, you know, you can, you can take the measurement and get a, a rough idea yeah. of how deep it is. It's not very deep. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it's smaller than the, the probe that we used in the lab. Yeah. And so it's like, you're not getting very deep. And like, let's just go ahead and say, like, if you're working with people in our realm, they're probably gonna be like slightly bigger, more muscular humans that have like, if we use the quad as an example, it's a really popular place to do this. If you've got a really big meaty quad, mm -hmm. you're only going to be getting data on like the super the top superficial layer of what's happening and you're missing everything in the deep muscle. Yep. And I remember Dr. David Poole asking me that. And part of the, the defense was, Hey, like, have you considered the heterogeneity between superficial and deep? Because yep. it looks like the majority of the action is potentially taking place in the deep muscle and not the superficial muscle. Yeah. So, and I, the reason he brought that up, so David does a lot of animal research and you know, a lot of human as well, but like my dissertation with David was primarily animal. Mm -hmm. And so in the rats, we can see like a dramatic heterogeneity of muscle fiber percentage. So like type one, type two, uh, in the rat, they like have entire muscles that are primarily type two and entire muscles that are in primarily type one. And so we're not that, that, um, I don't remember the term they used for it, but we're, we're not that dramatic in humans. But even in humans, we do have a kind of like gradient of fiber typing within a given muscle. And they've shown this with cadaver studies where it's a little easier for them to do it because they can take the whole cross-sectional area of a quad. We can't ethically do that in a living <laughs> human, right? Uh, but so even though we have a pretty homogenous fiber typing in the human quads, you do see that, you know, the more superficial portions of your muscle will be more type twos. And then that deeper muscle closer to the blood flow in the delivery, they are more type one. So the more oxidative muscle is deeper. So you may be biasing your interpretations based on a, a not very oxidative glycolytic muscle that's more superficial. Um, I do think another important consideration, it, so you mentioned the rectus uh, versus, so like we typically study the vastus because mm -hmm. the vastus does have less adipose tissue. Uh, I published a paper from my master's where we did that just four sites and you can see quite a dramatic heterogeneity of even adipose thickness on a given muscle. So like the, the rectus had more fat typically than a vastus lateralis in most people. Uh, the calf has less adipose tissue than both of those, you know? So it's, 
you get a bit of a heterogeneity in the adipose, adiposity. Um, but you also need to consider, so the rectus itself is, you know, I'm sure you're familiar, it's a double joint. So it crosses the hip and it innervates or it connects down on the knee. And so then if your activity is like running, maybe the rectus is a good choice. Uh, if you're looking at something like squatting or, you know, kicking and other things, maybe uh, a muscle that only innervates across the knee joint where you're getting your primary motion uh, is potentially better to do like the vastus. <laughs> sun's, sun, coming, sun's, sun's coming up here in Salt Lake. And yeah. we finally got some decent air quality today. We went on a walk this oh, morning yeah. and I was like, God, this is so nice. I'm not just like getting bombarded with all this fire smoke from California. And you fled California and you get away from it and it followed you. That's the thing. The people in California, like unless you're like right by the fire, obviously, and I don't want to I want to be careful with how I say this because the fires there are a true tragedy. But yes. like our my father and mother in law are in Santa Cruz, California. Geographically, they are way closer to these fires than we are. They have perfectly clear weather because all the smoke just Blowing blows east. east. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just get hammered over here. Um, okay. We so, actually, aside, we actually had to cancel several studies this week because we've had, you know, four or five days with really high pollution. Yep. I was wondering, I was actually talking to Kels about that the other day. She was like, what app should I use? I was like, well, we need to use Utah Airs. Like, that was when we used in the lab. Yeah. And I told her, I was like, you know, I bet they've had to cancel some studies because the average, the 24 hour average on the PM 2.5 has been yeah. really high. Orange are better for like five days now. So. High score wins, right? Yeah. <laughs> Worst air quality in the world last Friday. Yeah. Go us. Yay. <laughs> so one of the, one of the things I do want to talk about here as well is we've talked about flow and blood flow being such an important part of this supply utilization, this balance of supply and demand. Can you unpack a little bit? Because this is one of the things that I think, I think messed up the most across the board. The NEARS is not telling us supply <laughs> because what people are, what will try to do is they'll take the total component and then they're going to try to say, well, total is telling me essentially supply. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> like they, they'll track together. Right. But like you're, you just, you don't really have any idea what, su what the supply function is. You don't really know blood flow with just an ears. Right. So I'll touch on the total a little bit specifically. So there's some neat work that integrated the, hu the animal research that David Poole did and the, the human research that Tom Barstow did and Shinsaku Koga, they all kind of collaborated on this. And what they found was is that, so the hematocrit in the capillaries at rest is way lower than our systematic hematocrit. So our systemic hematocrit may be 45, 48% on a typical person, you know, but they showed that in those capillaries in the animals, it may be as low as 12% hematocrit. But when you start the muscular contractions that very quickly approaches a systemic level of hematocrit, it never quite gets to the full amount. But then they followed this up with a study in humans and we found, or we didn't find, but they found uh, that that total signal behaves very similar to that hematocrit at the capillary level. So if we take a step back a little bit, uh, the NEARS will detect the, the chromophores in tissues, including the venules and the arterioles and the capillaries. But once it gets over, I think they say about a millimeter, uh, so you're getting into your bigger uh, diameter vessels to that point, it's fully absorbing everything because there's so many red cells in there. And so most of your signal is coming from the microvasculature and the muscle. Um, but what they found is that when you go from rest to exercise, that total signal increases in a similar proportion that we see when we do the rat studies, the super invasive ones. So that total signal may actually represent more closely the hematocrit in that microvascular space rather than the flow. Because like, while yes, they increase, you know, proportionally, they're not necessarily equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so the function of the NEARS is measuring the, the volume or the, the concentration of these chromophores per volume of tissue. So in essence, you're getting a hematocrit assessment, especially during exercise, because mm -hmm. we don't expect the myoglobin to increase. So the only increase should be driven by an increase in red cell content below the probe. So while yes, it tracks with flow, it's not flow at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And very different. 
people can evaluate flow with the nearest devices, but you, again, you need to do periods of occlusion. You need to measure the changes in these signals uh, either during or immediately after occlusion. So like you, you can't really evaluate flow with the nearest device without doing a bunch of additional work to try to evaluate or control for these things. But even with the, the occlusion technique, if I remember this correctly, if you, so say you wanted to measure it on the arm, wherever it is, like an easy place to place a cuff. If I occlude, then I re release that cuff and I'm going to basically see total increase because it should be pretty minimal when I'm fully occluded. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to watch that trend line. If I remember correctly, you're only really, you have like those first one to two cardiac cycles, I think is what, what Barsaw had in his paper, right? Of it, you can only use that data for flow with, within a very short window of time immediately after releasing the cuff. Because once you're outside of those first one to two cardiac cycles, then you can't really still do that. Is that right? Yeah, that, you get some confounding factors now happening, right? So yeah, it, the there's very specific protocols with the occlusion and releases and the measurements to try and evaluate flow. And they, they've been validated. It's uh, I don't remember if you're familiar with the venous occlusion plethysmography, where they used to, uh, people still measure blood flow in limbs mm -hmm. with a little strain gauge around the limb. And then they do periods of occlusion and release, and they measure the, the, the change in circumference of that limb, and that kind of tracks with blood flow. And so in essence, you have to do the same thing with the nearest device if you want to evaluate flow. Uh, you can't do it during contractions. That's a big limitation because, uh, again, the the movement of the muscle and the blood vessels will confound what you're getting so you have to do it like during a, a period of rest between mm -hmm. the contractions so there are lots of limitations to it yeah for sure so if we wanted to zoom back out and talk more about this the sat measurement this yep. balance between oxygenated and total i'm not super familiar with this but if we wanted to think more applied, and I know this is a lot of what the guys at Nike did, so I need to get through that paper. But historically, have many people been able to successfully use something like SAT or even on the device that we had where we could get a strong, reliable deoxy signal? Could we use that in things like critical power assessment where we're trying to figure out this moderate, heavy, severe maybe do a little bit of prediction to time to exhaustion. Like I'm not going to be able to parse apart and say, well, this person's supply limited and this person's utilization limited, whatever a lot of that means. Um, yeah. despite the fact that people on the internet love that talk. Right. But if we want to think, cause critical power has a very strong basis in the literature would the sat measurement or even just the deoxy be good enough essentially to be able to start seeing and declaring moderate, heavy, severe, indicating like, oh, we have an inflection point here, things in that realm, if I'm making any sense. Or like a way yeah, more applied so, performance usage. Yeah, th this has been gaining a lot of steam in the last you know decade. And Ryan Brockshire and myself actually have got it into some scientific debates back and forth with other groups about whether this is appropriate or not. Um, because there, there has been a big push where people are saying, hey, your deoxy signal will continue increasing as you increase workload. So like with an incremental test, mm -hmm. uh, it'll keep going up, 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 up. And then it hits a, a kind of ceiling and it flatlines. And they're like, hey, when this thing flatlines, it can't go up anymore. That's your critical power. And critical power is a big, big, important thing in exercise physiology because there's some pretty strong evidence that that demarcates. It's the threshold for the highest sustainable metabolic rate where that's, you know, they're, they're, they're showing that the marathon runners are running at 98, 99% of their critical speed. Uh, and so it, it seems to be one of our stronger predictors of the upper l threshold is, it's a tricky word, mm -hmm. but the upper level of sustainable aerobic activity. So a lot of people want to find ways that say, hey, we can, we can isolate this with this non-invasive, super easy thing to stick on a leg. Uh, but there, there are lots of, there's lots of nuance to that for sure. But, um, you know, the, the saturation signals and the deoxy signals, they do behave like we should, they, they behave like we would expect with oxygen uptake where your different intensity domains. So you mentioned the moderate, so the moderate, you know, you very quickly reach a steady state oxygen uptake and you can sustain that activity for, you know, three, four hours 
or even longer. You can do that for days as long as you feed appropriately during the activity. Like the the ultra guys, they're mm-hmm. they're probably working down in the moderate range and eating tons of food between their hours of running. Uh, if you go above that heavy, um, so during the heavy, you do reach a steady state, but it's delayed a little bit because, you know, you are recruiting the higher order type two fibers and you are seeing changes in the, the perturbation in the muscles. So you're getting a little bit more acidotic kind of things like that, but you will reach a steady state and you can maintain that activity for a while, you know, several hours. If you, again, if you're appropriately hydrating, feeding and cooling, uh, but then if you go above critical power, you you predictably fatigue like and we're talking you know 20 20 minutes or even down to you know a minute that you can sustain this activity um so it's been a real important point that people try to pinpoint but you do there as with everything there's there's a lot of gray to it so specifically with the continuous wave i'm not sure without a big or complicated setup like the Nike paper, which we can talk about again, if you want to bring it back uh, or bring me back and talk about it, but there's, it requires lots of testing, uh, repeated testing. And then if you do it appropriately, it seems like it does predict athletic performance, at least during these aerobic events. So they, they measured it on runners with quite a range of distances for sure. Yeah. I need to get through the rest of that paper and then maybe we can come back and jam on that a little bit but what i'll do i'll throw links in the show notes to the barstow review i think yeah. that's still required reading if anybody yeah. is going to use the technology that review yeah. is fantastic and then i'll throw a link to the nike paper the barstow one you can get for free i know mm-hmm. like just off pubmed or google scholar the nike one yeah. you may need to hang some still friends embargo because it's so new so yeah okay a year from the date of publication people should be able to get it for free beautiful they Excellent. might be able to email the author and say hey can you send me the paper in the the author's allowed to share it. Okay, that works. Uh, but a quick take home. So I, we mentioned the different intensity domains and that SAT signal does behave differently based on the intensity domain. And so if if you know what you're looking for, you can kind of parse out. You say, hey, my saturation plateaued very quickly. So you're probably not working too hard. If your saturation takes a little longer to plateau, you're probably working in that heavy domain. And if you never quite get a plateau and said that sat just keeps dropping at a slow rate until it, you fail, you, you're, you're definitely in that severe domain above your critical power. Mm-hmm. And so again, with lots of repeated testing, you can kind of get an idea of where that threshold is and you can kind of set up your training around it for sure, because there's lots of evidence now that, and I'm, you know, I'm going to keep ha- hammering on this aerobic kind of activity that, that training at or around that critical speed, critical power is probably going to give you quite a good benefit on your training adaptations since you know where that threshold is and you can kind of push and design your training around it. But again, it it will take quite a few tests to try and figure that out. Yeah, actually, if you're doing all those tests, if you're doing all those tests, you can just calculate your critical power, your critical speed on its own without the nearest device. (laughs) That's true. That's yeah. very true. Excellent, man. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for coming on to do this. I hope no that everybody listening found this informative, incredibly helpful. So if anybody wanted to follow up with you, if you would like to be found and you can say no, no one has said no yet, but I'm waiting. Someone will eventually say no. Where's where the best place for them to reach out, contact or, or find you if they're really interested in this topic? So my university email is available if you find a paper that I'm on or that I wrote. Uh, you can put it in your show notes. I'm not too worried about my email getting out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, people can shoot me an email if they want to talk more about it. Uh, I tend to get back to people fairly quickly. Depends on how busy we are in that day and that week. But uh, yeah, I, I look forward to talking to more people about it. I do love NEARS. It's just it is one of those black boxes that people over interpret sometimes. So. Literally, literally and figuratively a black box. (laughs) (laughs) Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We'll have to do this again and talk through that Nike paper. I think that's such a really cool applied way of using this in a performance setting and actually trying to predict fatigue markers and things like that, time to exhaustion, et cetera. Um, But yeah, man, thank you. No problem.